So um, I'm John Gibbons, director of the UK CCS Research Centre. Uh, I've been working on carbon capture and storage for nearly 20 years now. And um, basically, the, the speaker we've got today almost, uh, I think, got me into it as well. Anna <laughs> Charles, when she was a, uh, an undergraduate student, um, she did a project on uh, taking CO2 from an offshore, offshore installation, putting it back in, offshore from the Shetland Islands, um, which got a fair bit of uh, interest at the time. Uh, it was actually considered by BP as well, <laughs> uh, I think in parallel, though we didn't know that. And um, that, that got quite a lot of interest in Parliament, uh, started to get CCS at the agenda, and I think uh, was one of the factors that helped to get CCS on the uh, Glen Eagles Agreement in 2005, which is where it really hit uh, international uh, attention. So, uh, so Hannah's been working on CCS for a long, long time, um, keeping me in order whenever she can, uh, and doing a lot of original work, particularly, I think, about flexibility uh, on electricity supply, though I don't know if she'll get to talk about that today. So the purpose of this lecture is really to, to get people going on carbon capture and storage, um, to try and come at it and explain uh, why it's important and, and basically how you do it, but not to tell you everything about it. We've got a, another nearly 20 lectures um, to go into specialist topics. But as I was saying at, at the start, it would be useful uh, if people have questions, even if we're not going to answer them in this uh, talk, it'd be very useful to, to hear your questions, see what people want to know about carbon capture and storage, and then we do have quite a lot of uh, ability to shape future sessions um, with other academics so that we can address those questions. So I think without more ado, Hannah, um, if you want to get started and give us the benefit of your 20 years experience of carbon capture and storage. Thank you. Excellent. So good morning. Uh, John's already introduced me. Um, so I've been asked to give an overview of, of what will come in the next set of lectures. Um, this is, of course, an overview that draws on my you know, discussions and understandings built with you know, a huge number of colleagues over, over a period of time. So just to acknowledge that there are many of people that, that could say you know, hi and hello and, and begin to introduce CCUS for you. So uh, I'm assuming that some of you are, are quite new. Some of you will know, you know a good amount from, from your current experience. But I'm going to try to go back to basics and give you some basic language and a framework that you can use to put whichever of the, the kind of the future Future lectures that you choose to attend kind of into so hopefully it will be a whistle stop tour of of the kind of bigger picture and then that will help you to to kind of make sense of and pick up what you need from from the detailed series that follows so two things i'm going to cover today why consider ccs um you know it's it's not obvious that, that this is a thing you'd want to do at least it certainly wasn't when i started to work in the field um, and then a bit of kind of technology 101 um, so I'm not going to talk about policy, I'm not going to talk about economics, uh, that will come uh, later and I'm sure you also know much about that from, from your own context. So very much more on the climate science and the, and the technology or the beginnings of the technology for you today. Um, so I believe first up before you get into the technology uh, in, in, the, in the overall series will be Miles Allen and the idea of um, what's going on in our atmosphere and in particular this, this idea of cumulative carbon so the idea that you know our atmosphere can hold so, so much carbon dioxide um, and then if you keep putting more in you know and other greenhouse gases then you're going to start to run into trouble of course for many people that work in our sector today you know this this is a kind of known concept it's not a big surprise um, but when we first started to talk with people about CCS when Miles and others and our committee on climate change kind of took on board this idea of cumulative carbon and that way of thinking it was kind of quite new and different and it wasn't obvious that you did just have to stop after you'd emitted a certain amount that there was a lot of discussion about what a kind of an allowable rate emission rate forever might be etc cetera, etc cetera. so the, the the discourse and the narrative is now very different to how it was you know, before Miles and others made that contribution. So uh, I'm not going to speak in detail about this stuff. You know, he will do that for you next week, I think. But um, but yeah, the, that underpinning idea that the total amount of carbon dioxide is not is what matters, not how much you emit per year, is really important for thinking about why on earth you would do carbon capture and storage, basically. So then, you know, with that idea of it's a total amount of stuff in the atmosphere that matters, 
uh, you get on to, well, what's an effective way to keep the fossil carbon in the ground? Because if we burn the, fo the fossil fuels, we are going to get more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, unless we take you know, measures to do otherwise. So one option, of course, is that you do just leave the fossil carbon in the ground. You know, there's, there's many people in the environmental community and in other places who are like, actually, just don't extract the coal, leave it there. Um, so then the question you've got to ask um, is, well, if that's your strategy for, for keeping carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, can you keep enough fossil fuel in the ground for long enough. So your question is, can I achieve less than 1% use per century over millennia of the fossil fuels that make carbon dioxide? And um, when you put carbon capture and storage on the table, you've got a different question. So I'm gonna keep the fossil carbon in the ground, but now I'm keeping it in the ground as carbon dioxide rather than as fossil fuel. So now I've got geologically stored carbon dioxide in the ground and I need to make sure that any leakage is at a level that's acceptable for climate change and any other environmental considerations. So there are there are some who believe we should focus on the left hand of this slide, you know, really keep the fossil fuel in the ground and, and um, you know, just leave it there and get your head around that planet. Uh, but for some of us, you know, while we would love to, to not have fossil fuel being extracted and all the environmental impacts of that, actually, we're kind of pragmatic about it. You know, we we realize that um, you know the amount of energy use that's going on in the world and the, the energy service that's so on that comes with that means that we are going to be using fossil fuels. Um, and if we're in that kind of a world, then actually let's get stuck into this carbon and capture and storage thing. Let's see if we can get technologies that really do remove the carbon dioxide where it's being produced from, from combustion of fossil fuels or, or other fuels with carbon. Uh, let's get this, this, the actual storage part sorted and feel confident that we can answer um, that question of can we keep the CO2 safely in the subsurface? So, um, you know, different people take different perspectives on that. I'm not here to lecture you about, you know, your philosophy of whether CCS is a good idea or not. I'm just kind of trying to frame what the challenge is and what the questions are and what CCS offers as part of that kind of mix of things that we're trying to do to, to make our energy economy not destroy the planet for one of a sort of milder way to put it. Um, one of the things that's developed a lot you know, in the time that I've been working on carbon capture and storage is, well, what are we actually doing carbon and capture and storage kind of with or, or for? So, you know, in the early days, you know, when, when we were doing the kind of thing that John spoke about in the introduction, it was very much about fossil fuels. It was about coal, maybe some gas. And um, the idea that we want to, to get most of the fossil carbon back in the ground, and yes, there'll be a, a small amount of residual emission. Uh, maybe not as much as some people think, but, you know, the, the, no doubt other people will get into that. So, um, in recent times, there's been much more thinking, of course, around the net zero agenda. And well, actually, we might need to remove carbon dioxide that's already in the atmosphere. And what are our options for that? Um, and then we get into the ideas of, well, what happens with when you combine bioenergy with, with CCS? So um, I guess you're familiar with the idea that when trees grow, they remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And if there's no carbon capture and storage involved, then when they're burned for, for whatever or used for whatever, the carbon dioxide is released again. So uh, you have the, you know, you're, you're in a position where basically you're kind of climate neutral, give or take, with, with some detail about life cycle analysis. Um, and with carbon capture and storage, you have that possibility to actually remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So you, the tree grows or whatever your fuel is and removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere like in around now or you know in, in, in recent decades rather than, than millennia ago. And then if combined with carbon capture and storage, we can actually put some of that carbon dioxide very much you know, in the subsurface out of the way for a long time. Um, so that idea of you know, different things that carbon capture and storage might do, um, you know, which parts of our economy is it important for, you know, is something that I'm sure you think about a lot um, in, in, in your roles. Um, and it's something that's been thought about quite a lot in, in the academic sector and, and others in recent times. So it's, it's quite a different world in some ways to the one that I, you know, I was originally working in you know, 15, 15 years ago or whenever. Um, the other thing that, that we'll speak about when we get to technology is, is the idea of industry. So not just power plants, but you know, big industrial sites and you know, doing, doing things for them with carbon capture and storage where perhaps there really are much fewer alternatives than, um, than what might be available for power. And that's 
that kind of idea of CCS for industry is another thing that's helped some of the environmental NGOs to engage with the idea that CCS might have a role, even if it's not something that they would support for, for all parts of our, our economy. So I think what we're doing today is, is kind of speaking through all of the slides and then taking questions. So I'm sure there are some questions about why consider CCS and was it really a good idea? Uh, very happy to speak further about that and, and to have a discussion in due course. But uh, for the purposes of keeping the recording kind of straightforward, we'll talk a bit about technology first and then we'll stop the recording and, and have an open discussion. So um, in technology, um, I'm sure most of you have, have kind of um, been introduced to the idea that we tend to split CCS projects down into capture, transport and storage. I'm not really going to speak much about utilisation today. So the idea that you've captured the CO2 but might then use it for something, that is of course an important thing for, for, for you to be aware of. Um, but from the point of view of, of climate change mitigation, it tends not to be the biggest game in town. So in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to focus much more on geological storage, um, on what we're doing to get carbon dioxide available for, for transport and storage, and then a little bit about transport as well. So uh, that's where I'm starting from. We can, of course, talk more about utilisation um, once we get into the questions, if you'd like to. So what are we doing? Um, so kind of conventional carbon capture and storage, uh, three steps, as I've, I've kind of already said. So first of all, you need to separate out your carbon dioxide from whatever else was going on. So perhaps you have a power plant and you've, you've burnt your fuel, uh, you've generated some, you've, you've used the energy to generate some power, whatever, and you've now got carbon dioxide. Um, in a moment, we'll talk about you know, the different processes that you might use, but fundamentally what you're doing is you're separating out the carbon dioxide from all the other gases that, that it might be um, intermingled with. Um, and then you're saying, well, what am I gonna do with that carbon dioxide? Um, and what we tend to do with it is to compress it to uh, a relatively high pressure, not unimaginably high, but, you know, quite a high pressure. Um, and at that point, uh, depending on exactly which project we're looking at, you know, a, a whole bunch of things about the, you know, the particular case that we're with, uh, we'll either transport it normally by pipeline or by ship. Um, just because if we're doing climate change mitigation, we tend to be talking about really large volumes. So you know, we have learned over time that the, the things that tend to work, you know, economically and technically are, are pipelines or, or ships. Um, the ship transport option is less well developed, but it, you know, there are examples of it happening for real. And there's a lot of interest and work going on in some parts of Europe now um, to, to kind of move forward that option as being a, a real thing that's really there for, for some of the clusters and uh, some of the projects that, that might appreciate having that option. And then the reason that you're transporting it is that in general, the place where you want to leave the CO2 for a long time is a different place to the place where you, where you um, produce the CO2. So you then put it deep underground, deep, deep, deep underground in secure storage. So there's different geology that you, that you look at for that, but basically you look for a bit of geology where we're really confident that the carbon dioxide will stay contained in a particular part of the subsurface. Um, and also that there are layers above so that if it does misbehave you know, slightly or behave slightly differently to what we you know, anticipated when we modeled the, the, the storage plan, uh, there, there are kind of secondary and, and often also tertiary ways to keep the CO2 trapped well away from the water that it's underneath in our context or, or the land if it's, if it's in other parts of the world. So um, that's your three steps. You're, you're getting the carbon dioxide by itself. Uh, then you're moving it to where you're going to store it, and then you're putting it in a well-characterized, well-understood bit of geology and leaving it there for a very long time. So how do we do that you know, in a bit more detail? Uh, before I dive into the, the technology a little bit, just to, just to kind of get you started before the detail in, in the next few weeks, it's perhaps worthwhile just taking one slight step back um, and saying, well, actually, you've done all this process, but you know, how do we know that that's actually going to you know, help the climate, you know, and we, John and I, you know, put, put this set of thinking together. It's not used a lot in the, in the broader world, but I tend to use it in introductory talks like this one, just to help people get clear in their own minds about, you know, is CCS going to save the planet? You know, if it is, you know, how, how do we know? Um, and the answer, of course, is that some CCS projects actually aren't going to do enough to, you know, achieve the net zero and all that kind of thing. Uh, so there's a bunch of projects which, which are called class one in this slide, you know, in this way of thinking, which are, are those where, 
you know, you're doing something where you still produce a product that contains carbon. So, you know, the, the oil sands projects or, or liquefied natural gas. The key point is that there is something that still contains carbon that's going to go out away from the site where you're working. Um, and of course, when that thing that contains carbon is burned or otherwise used somewhere else. So, you know, if you've made coal to liquids and you've now got a, a, a fuel that can be burned in, in a vehicle or something, um, then that carbon dioxide, when it's burned later, is going to end up in the atmosphere. So that might be used as carbon capture and it might not. You're not in control of that. So in that context, class one projects are useful. You know, they, they don't. They, you know, they don't make the world a worse place necessarily, but uh, they don't get you to where you need to be in, in the context of net zero and all that kind of stuff. Um, class two projects are the ones that are, are perhaps most familiar, certainly the main thing that was, was spoken about 10, 15 years ago. And they're the ones where you're doing a kind of, you're using a fuel that contains carbon, um, a fossil fuel in general. You know, you've, you've got a point, you've, you're generating electricity or hydrogen or heat. The whole point is you're, you're making something that has no carbon left in it. So when your electricity or your hydrogen or your heat moves out into be used for whatever it's used for, it's not possible to make more carbon dioxide anymore because there are no carbon atoms there to make the carbon dioxide. Um, so that's that. those kind of projects are going to make a big contribution to, to net zero. Um, you, you may have a little bit of residual emission. I mentioned that before in, in the slide with the picture, in the, with the circles, but um, depending on what kind of world you're in and whether you're really serious about the whole net zero thing and, and making a substantial difference for climate change, you know, if you have a power plant with, with carbon capture, you can easily push your, your capture levels 95% you know, plus for some of the, the technologies that are closest to kind of widespread rollout, according to the vendors and, and the tests and work they've been doing. So um, although you may see a lot written about, oh, there's going to be a lot of residual emissions, it's going to be a big challenge. Yes, we need to, to kind of keep an eye on that. But basically, with these class two um, type projects, so consider a power plant or you know a hydrogen generation facility using a fossil fuel um, you're at the point where the residual emission is now really quite low um, and it should make a big impact um, in, in terms of meeting your net zero targets or whatever it is that your country or, or region is working with. Um, and then you get into class three and they're the ones that were on the, the sort of right hand side of that, that picture I showed earlier, the ones where you're actually doing something that removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So you're addressing the residual emissions of class two, or maybe there's a few things that we really want to do in our economy that you know, we just can't do carbon capture on that activity. So for example, if we believe that people should be allowed to keep flying and you know, the fuels that are used for that are releasing carbon carbon dioxide into the atmosphere or other greenhouse gases and so on. So in those contexts, you, you're in the position of actually removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere when you think about it sort of net over you know, a few decades, not like millennia, just a few decades, um, which is a timescale that's relevant for, for climate stuff. Um, and in there, you've got two different groups of technologies. You've got direct air capture type technologies, which often are referred to as DAC at the moment, of course. And then you've got biomass enhanced CCS or BEX, uh, so 3B and 3A. So they're quite different sort of technically in terms of what's going on in some ways, uh, but they have the same sort of function in terms of uh, removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, uh, although it's slightly different sort of ways. Um, things like enhanced oil recovery and, and replacing natural gas in, in, in oil fields and things. I've written that they're great areas. Um, the, I suppose the point here is that you can run for an enhanced oil recovery project in quite different ways. So sometimes you can run a project so that you produce, you know, your, your focus is on storing as much carbon dioxide as possible. And yes, you produce some oil, but not that much in the overall scheme of things. And then you can also run projects such that you produce really quite a lot of oil for not so much carbon dioxide stored. So depending on the drivers around your project, that may have a different influence on how useful that is for, for the climate and, and meeting that zero type concerns. Um, so when John and I were talking about me doing this, we discussed the IPCC special report on CCS. It was written in 2005 and we were like, is that a good thing to recommend or, or is it a bit old now? And um, Basically, I haven't been through the, the fine print of it recently, but, but basically um, this report was went through absolutely the state of the art at the time. Um, and for many things on the technology side, it's actually still you know, a good enough place to start. 
Um, the economics and policy have moved on a lot. So, you know, I wouldn't read those chapters, but on the technology side, if you just want to get some basic vocabulary and, you know, think about where to start, actually, there's many worse places to, to start than this report, even though it's, it's, it's quite old. It is kind of a milestone publication for us as a community. Um, and one of the pictures which I, which I still use and you see here is the one that gives the overview of the different types of, of ways of doing carbon capture. Um, just because to some extent now everybody assumes that everybody knows this stuff. And of course, many people are new to CCS as it, as it kind of takes off again. So it's still useful to go back to basics in my opinion. So the one that, that people often think about and that's perhaps easiest to conceive is, is this one here where you have fuel, coal, gas, biomass, whatever, um, and you're burning it. And when you burn it, you make, you use the energy from the, from the combustion to make power, maybe to make hydrogen. Um, but basically these, these tend to be kind of power plant type projects. Uh, you can have other things in the box, but this is a diagram that's showing power. And you separate out the waste gases that you make from that process. So you burn your fuel and um, eventually you get to the point where you've got a whole bunch of stuff with a little bit of carbon dioxide in it. So you've got air, air has a lot of nitrogen for the chemists among you. Um, so if you've got a lot of stuff with CO2, uh, then what you need to do is a CO2 separation process to separate out the CO2 from the other stuff. Uh, so lots of, you know, lots of nitrogen, a little bit of CO2. So things like, you know, amine-based post-combustion capture that you hear about, that's a classic example here. And um, once you've got your CO2 separate from your other stuff, your CO2 can then be treated, you know, compressed. Um, you know, if it's a bit wet, it can be made dry and then it goes into your transport system. Um, to some extent, then the next thing to think about, let's, is to jump over the pre-combustion for now and come to the oxyfuel. And then the oxyfuel technologies, what we see is a slightly different way of doing things. Um, and one of the kind of big energy challenges for post-combustion capture is that the separation of CO2 from lots of other stuff is, is difficult to do. So an option is to say, well, actually, what I need for my combustion for, for the power generation process is oxygen, it's not all the other stuff. So what you can do is use well, well established air separation technologies and just use the oxygen in the, in the power generation process and get rid of the nitrogen, get it out the way. Um, so when you have it, when you do things that way, you're then in a situation where you mix your fuel with your oxygen, uh, you do what you need to do to make sure the combustion temperatures don't get too high. Um, and th at the end of that process, you've still made power. Um, but you've now got CO2 with a bit of stuff in it, rather than having a whole load of stuff with a small amount of CO2. So that CO2 does, of course, still need some treatment and, and, and compression and things. And the treatment's a bit more tricky um, because, you, you know, there's, there's bits and pieces that, that, um, that are there that you wouldn't have if you just separated the CO2 as you do in the post-combustion process. But you find that, you know, this idea of, well, actually, let's have CO2 plus stuff rather than stuff plus CO2 is helpful for some projects. So the Allen cycle um, is, is an oxyfuel type process in some ways. It's, it's kind of built out of, of things like that. And there's others um, that, that kind of, especially with coal, when we were looking at coal-fired coal power plants, it was very hard to see whether post-combustion or oxyfuel would necessarily be the best way to go. Of course, in the UK context, we're not so much thinking about coal-fired power ge generation anymore, but there are some places where this idea of separating out the nitrogen at the beginning, rather than having a difficult separation of CO2 at the end is, is, a, is a good way to go. Then you've got something that's a bit different. Uh, we talk about pre-combustion capture. Now, in a way, this is kind of named sort of not quite right because it's it's giving it, what you actually have in here is a process which is strictly not quite combustion as you know a scientist would know it but the point is that you take the stuff that happens here so gasification reforming and things and what you're doing is you're taking fuel coal gas biomass again you know take your choice and you're doing a bunch of chemical processes that eventually leave you with a mixture of carbon dioxide plus hydrogen so again, you've still got a separation process, but the separation here is to keep, is to keep hydrogen and carbon dioxide separated from each other. Um, 
And then once you've got your hydrogen, you can do what you like with it. This diagram is quite focused on power. Um, but of course, you can do many other things with hydrogen. Um, and your carbon dioxide, again, at this point is, is ready for you know, some treatment and, and going away to storage. So depending on exactly where you want to do your separation processes and your cleanup processes, your chemical cleanup processes, you can end up feeling that one or other of these technologies makes more sense. Um, the, the industrial processes in, in this context, you know, several years ago was kind of tagged on the bottom, not quite as an afterthought, but as something that wasn't receiving anywhere near so much attention. But the, the point here is that, um, you know, any variation of post-combustion, pre-combustion or oxyfuel can turn out to be the best thing to use for a particular industrial process. So depending on what sector you're in, what what's kind of already happening in terms of whether you're using oxygen for something already or you know whatever whether it's a hydrogen facility or, or not you can find that one or other variation on the theme of, of post pre and, and oxy combustion can can make some sense so um i liked this figure because it did at least mention industrial processes even though uh, it, it perhaps focuses a bit more on power than, than maybe some some of us do nowadays when thinking about ccs and of course power is still important uh, and for me i think it is a sector that that could and should use ccs as, as it goes forward so there will be tons more on all the different co2 capture options um in due course um, and we can talk a bit more in, in discussion as well if if you want to i'm aware there's quite a lot of bits and pieces to, to take in when at first sight um but let's talk a bit about storage so i'm not a geologist i'm an engineer um but whenever i speak with people about ccs for the first time they're always much more interested about whether it's going to be stored safely and all that stuff than they are about the technical blah of, of co2 capture so storage overview um so saline formations sometimes called saline aquifers um are are the thing that that are like are the, the the kind of geology that are likely to um to be most of where CO2 ends up if we're doing CCS big time across the world. Um, and that is a bit of geology where it's possible to, to get carbon dioxide into the, into the subsurface. So, you know, think of a sponge, you know, picking up water basically. Um, and what you're kind of trying to see shown in this diagram is that there's, there's real layers of rock, which are a bit like a sponge that the CO2 can go into. So there's water there and it can kind of displace or intermingle with the water. Um, and then there's a bit above it which is impermeable to carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide doesn't just float up to the surface, it gets stopped. And we can use um, the techniques from oil and gas to characterize the subsurface and to understand where these formations are, you know, where it's likely to be good to, to put carbon dioxide and have it held by what gets called a cap rock. Um, there are other places that sort of do similar things in the geology, but that have different names because there's different stuff already in the subsurface. Uh, so although it's not something that we talk about much, there is the possibility of using coal seams that, weren't, that aren't gonna be mined, enhanced coal bed methane is what the ECBM acronym means, um, where you might push methane out as you put the carbon dioxide in. Um, so you, know, you can do that kind of thing, but it's unlikely to be a big, um, big player in the UK context. Uh, we've already spoken briefly about enhanced oil recovery. So the orange thing that's coming up there um, for, for option three on this slide is oil with some CO2 in it. So uh, the CO2, any that's produced with the oil will be separated and put back down into the geology and the oil will then be of a quality to, to go and do whatever you would normally have done with, with that product. And then you also have depleted oil and gas reservoirs, which of course are important in the UK context as well. So um, they, they're ones where you've done as much oil and gas production as, as you're going to do, you've stopped producing. There's now kind of space you know, in that geology uh, for, you, for you to put some carbon dioxide you know, back into that, into that formation. So um, there's slightly different challenges about operating these different projects, you know, which, which are, on the one hand, you know your geology well for a depleted oil and gas reservoir because you've been working it for oil and gas for a long time. On the other hand, you may have drilled a few extra holes because you were extracting hydrocarbons from that from that part of the geology. Uh, so we do know how to do you know well closures and and you know, keeping keeping that kind of that bit of geology well contained. Um, but there's a different set of things to think about and consider uh, than perhaps a saline aquifer where 
you know, it's, you've never touched it before. So it's just one hole or you know, a limited number of holes that are there deliberately for your CO2 storage project, etc. So again, as you go through the series and over the summer, um, I'm sure there will be others who know much more about this than me who will come and speak with you more about that if it's something that's of interest and concern for you. It's certainly something that people have been thinking about for a long time and take seriously. Here's another uh, image that, that comes from that special report on, on CCS from uh, not quite a millennia ago, but you know, some time ago. Um, again, you know, this might not be absolutely perfect in terms of current science for today, but I find it a useful image and haven't found a, a more recent one that I find more helpful. The, the point here is, is to answer the, well, will it leak question? And in particular, is it safe to leave it? And when might it be safe to leave it? So one of the, the big things that has been important in developing um, business models that work is to think about, well, what's the long-term liability? You know, how long does a company have to be responsible for having custody of any CO2 that it's stored? Um, you know, what's the risk that it, it, it kind of walks away and all of a sudden something happens and government is left with a liability that it's unhappy about? And as we understand it, and you know, again, you know, ask my colleagues for, for more detail perhaps, but as we understand it, CO2 storage has the, the useful feature that it inherently gets safer with time. So the longer you leave it, the less likely it is that the CO2 will get back to the, to the surface. So when you initially put the carbon dioxide into the, the geological formation, you do find that having a good cap rock, you know, making sure that it can't, you know, it can move around a bit within the subsurface, you know, within the spongy rock. Um, but actually, you know, you, you've chosen a place where, where, it, where it's not going to get too far and that's all good. But over time, the chemistry and physics of the subsurface start to play and the CO2 actually gets stuck in bits of the geology. Um, and eventually, um, some of it actually becomes solid, you know, an actual carbonate rock. But it, once you're into residual trapping and solubility trapping and so on, your CO2, you know, the chances of that stuff getting to the subsurface are, are you know, nobody likes to say zero because scientists are worried about saying zero, but the, they're bound up in the, in, the, in, in the rocks and the water in the rocks and so on in, in ways that would be, you know, it's very, very, very difficult to imagine how on earth that would get to the subsurface in a way that would be damaging. Um, so, as I say, you, for expert advice on this, I wouldn't come to me, uh, but just to give you that idea as, as part of your kind of initial overview, if, if this stuff is new to you, um, I thought I'd put that in there for you and then that can be unpacked for you um, with, with appropriate colleagues in, in coming weeks and beyond if, if that's useful. Um, the other thing, of course, is, well, you say that and, you know, in theory, you think it will be OK, but how can you check? Because, you know, it is only theory to some extent. Um, and that's when you get on to monitoring and thinking about good ways to do monitoring. So, again, this is quite an old document, and I'm sure that people that come and speak with you about monitoring and as part of this series or, or in other parts of your, your life will, will have more up to date things. But uh, for me, as a, as a non geologist, I find this particular picture helpful because it kind of makes the point that uh, everything we do is based on good, high quality, careful site characterization. So, uh, you know, using techniques from the oil and gas sector and so on, we can look um, and make sense of what's a good place to put carbon dioxide and what isn't. So that means a licensing regime, you know, can reasonably, you know, expect people to do that. And then there is a bunch of stuff that, you know, we, we kind of do know about how to, how to kind of look at things, how to make sense of risks, how to manage risks and, and all that kind of stuff and different techniques for monitoring that we can use. So there's two parts to monitoring. One is, keeping an eye on it and making sure that what you expect is, is what's happening. And the second thing is to have a remediation plan for, for risks that you could you can reasonably expect. Um, so again, there are others in, in the academic community and, and elsewhere that know much more about this kind of stuff than I do. But I suppose just to say that um, the people that want to operate these projects or are operating these projects do have a good understanding of, of risk assessment and risk management. And there's a whole suite of different options for, for doing monitoring and um, to make sense of things and to see if something is, um, you know, if there's something that's different from your original model of the project, you, know, you, you will be able to see that there are different ways that you can respond to that before you've got a major environmental disaster on your hands or anything. So um, there's a lot of detail in there, just like there's a lot of detail in the, in the capture technologies, but the, the kind of the frameworks and the thinking about how to do, uh, you know, risk based understanding of what's okay and what's not okay and, and all that kind of stuff is there and 
you know, hopefully for those of you that need to understand that as part of your roles, we know we, we can within the academic community or, or elsewhere find people that can help you to, to make sense of, of what you need to make sense of. Finally, briefly, I've been talking for a while, um, transport. So um, as I said at, at the top, you know, pipelines and ships are, are, are the kind of thing that we see in town. You know, the idea of, of buffer storage and having some flexibility in your system for, for ships, you, you kind of have to have buffer storage because they're, you know, you fill up, they're quite big vessels and they only come once in a while. Uh, for, for, for pipelines, uh, as, as John said, I'm not talking about it today, but you know, much of my research work has been looking at where you find flexibility in CCS systems, including in questions around the pipeline uh, network and how you might manage it and so on. So I suppose the, the big things to say on this from, from my perspective around pipeline planning, you know, there is on, on offshore storage, on offshore CO2 pipelines, there, there's not that much experience of, of running these lines, but um, there is some experience. So there's, there's stuff that we can, we can learn from and, um, I, I'm kind of hopeful if there was any really big issues, we'd know about them by now. Um, onshore pipelines, you know, I'm sure you've heard that they've they've been used for decades in in in, um, in North America for for EOR projects. And um, the caveat that's important um, is that, of course, they're often in places with little or no population, so uh, they haven't been unregulated, of course, but there there has perhaps been a different set of kind of need around how you kind of think about and do risk risk management um, but you know in our country we the, the health and safety executive and others have been very much aware of CCS for a, a substantial period of time and um, you know they they have they've kind of as projects have come and gone they have been developing and kind of making the capacity that's needed to understand uh, what is you know, CO2 in pipelines going to look like you know what do we need to do to have a have a regulatory framework and a kind of risk-based framework that we tend to use for health and safety in our country you know what does you know, what does that look like? Have we got the data that we need? Um, you know, a bunch of research to, to make sure that we did have the data that we need started relatively early. Uh, so there are still things that, that people aren't necessarily 100% sure about, but, um, but in the UK, we are well placed to understand, you know, what the risks might be and, and how we want to develop our, our, our pipelines um, and, and so on to, to do what we what we want them to do. Um, I should point out, I threw in the word supercritical there, perhaps without um, really defining it earlier. So we don't mean supercritical as in nuclear reactor about to go boom. It's just a particular, uh, what we call phase of, uh, of a fluid. So it's dense, uh, really dense so that you can, so that it doesn't take, too, take up too much space in the pipeline, but it also has the viscosity of a gas. So it can still kind of move quite well, even though it's dense. Uh, so it's just because of the way that the CO2 properties work, it's just the way that it, it sort of makes sense to move it around. But because it's we don't use supercritical CO2 for that much other stuff, it's a relatively unusual phase. And um, there has been some thinking that's been done to make sense of what that means for pipeline materials and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of work around existing infrastructure and adapting it for new uses, of course. Um, which we can talk about in, in due course, but I'm aware that there was supposed to be time for, for questions and discussion and um, time is marching on. Uh, so I think I want to stop there. I'm aware it was a bit of a whistle stop and that every time I give a talk like this, some parts are clear and some parts are less clear, but I hope that there was some stuff in there that was useful and clear for you. Uh, if there are things you'd like to talk about you know, in more detail afterwards, myself or, or other colleagues from, from this, the centre will be very happy to do that. You can find me in LinkedIn if, if you want to say hi or, or my email address is, is also totally fine. Um, we're about to take questions. One final thing is that uh, in addition to the series that, that you're going to have here, if, if you want to access it, if, if you're into massive online open courses or MOOCs, uh, a couple of colleagues at Edinburgh do have one around carbon capture and storage. Uh, which is free unless you want the certificate. If, if you want a certificate, it costs you about 30 quid or something. Um, so that's there to get, and they've got kind of properly considered introduction across all the different parts of, of the CCS chain as well. So I'm not here to do a sales pitch, but some people find that kind of resource useful. Uh, it was put together with audiences like the one that we have today in mind. So uh, you can explore that if, if you think that that would be helpful for you. I think I'm going to stop there, if that's okay with, with John and whoever's in the chair, and then maybe start to take some questions and comments.